Welcome back to the podcast. In this episode, Sean Donahue is joined by Al Solozano of E360 to discuss the worst disasters they've recovered from. Surprise twist, not all clouds are cumulonimbus, say that fast three times, and not all disasters are natural. So let's join the conversation. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome everybody back to the podcast. I'm your guest host, Sean Donahue, and I am thrilled today because we have uh, show favorite Al Solorzano from E360 joining us again today. Al, welcome back. Wow, show favorite. Uh, how many guests you've had on by now, Sean? I, I don't know about that, but no, I, I've enjoyed th- these podcasts, by the way. I've been, I've been watching the ones, uh, the one that you recently did with Charlie Wong from NVIDIA. Uh, I, was, I was listening to that while I was doing some work. That was a great presentation. I'm a huge fan of those NVIDIA grid cards and, and you know, Nutanix makes it easy of getting those in those machines and getting those out for those virtual desktops. So I've loved, loved that idea and that was a great podcast. Awesome, Everyone should listen. thank you. Advertising. I appreciate that. I like to listen to these podcasts back and and not one and a half speed, but 0.5 speed. So my voice gets lower (laughs) and it's, uh, yeah, I I love to, to experience that. But today, Al, why I'm so excited, uh, more than usual is because we're talking about one of the things that I absolutely love talking about, but not love living through. And that's, Disaster recovery or business continuity. And I said, I said to myself, I said, self, you know, I guarantee you, Al's got some amazing stories of some absolute, uh, let's keep it clean, absolute horror shows that he's walked into from a disaster type recovery. So that's what I wanted to start with today is what, what is your worst? Uh, disaster that you've experienced. Now, I have to uh, frame this. What's your worst <laughs> compute disaster oh, that you've experienced? Good. We're I'm not going to talk you about your coolots that. phase back in the 1990s here. <laughs> the uh, the uh, sea flocks. Uh, what was that? Uh, what was that band that had the uh, that thing? Iran that had the the uh, the flock of seagulls. Wavy hair, flock of seagulls guy. Yeah, I can I can tell you that my whole phase on that whole thing. Um, no, you know, yeah, walking, you know, I guess the question really is, is, is it really walking into a disaster or is it preparing? Cause you're always preparing for some sort of disaster, right? Yeah. There's going to be something that happens, whether that's ransomware conversations, you know, DR and other conversations. So, yeah, I mean, I think I've walked into a couple different scenarios, you know, I've walked in from anything from where, you know, customers have deleted the storage repository by mistake, of every machine uh, machine instance and trying to figure out how to recover. Uh, I've seen instances of databases. Uh, they were doing cleanups on databases and they just were like, hey, let me let me just turn off this database and see what happens. And then everything goes to pot. Um, you know, and, and really, you know, when we talk about business continuity and DR, you know, we, we always focus on the customer's requirements, you know, what's their RTOs and RPOs, right? Return to operations and recovery point objectives. Mm-hmm. But realistically, it's always been a conversation of cost, right? They're like, hey, if we're down for an hour, what is that costing the organization? If we're down for five hours, five days, five months, what does that look like? And they kind of try to do a cost analysis to figure out like, it's like insurance, right? What's it worth to me to spend on a monthly or yearly basis for for DR and and business continuity? And then what do I lose if if I don't have it, Mm -hmm. right? Now, when we're having conversations with customers, we're actually spinning it a little bit and we're spinning it into more of the conversation of it really shouldn't be a, a conversation of if you have to have it or should you have it. It actually should be, yes, you need it. And now with the cloud, we have a lot more options of how you're going to deal with business continuity and DR. Because if you really think about it, most native applications, like a, like it's not like Google you know, is thinking about their DR plan, right? In terms of how Google.com uh, is, is provided to the user's interface. It's just part of it. Yeah. Well, that's how realistically most organizations should be thinking, right? Business continuity and DR should be involved in every one of their conversations. It actually should be, um, shouldn't even be thought of. It should just be something you're already developing and building into your plans. And, you know, we've, we've been doing a lot with hybrid cloud architectures, been doing a lot with Nutanix, especially now with Nutanix clusters, like we've talked about in the last episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, the NC2 stuff is has been very interesting for our customers because it gives them that capability. 
And I like how you you phrase it at first because it makes you think of, you know, the old way of thinking of BCDR in a insurance policy type of mindset. Like we know, and a lot of our organizations know how many hundreds of thousands, even into the millions of dollars they're going to lose if they're for every minute of, of downtime. We know that. So, so factoring that cost against, you know, what it's going to you know, cost to maintain and keep some sort of a uh, continuity disaster recovery plan in place, whether that's, like you said, a colo location, and that's kind of where I want to get into uh, as well, because, you know, I, and I also want to get into where we're we moving to. And you already gave the sneak peek into that with, the uh, you know, the hybrid cloud and using public cloud as that option. Um, but, you know, I remember back in the days going, and I'm going to, uh, uh, admit to it here. Here comes the big admission. This is, this is the, um, this is the, uh, uh, what do I call that? The, the conclave of, of the sanctity of, of the space we're in now. <laughs> um, that I caused, this is way back in the day, back in Netware 311. If, if anybody remembers those days of not just the tape carousels, yeah. uh, for the backups, um, in kit and the policy was keeping seven tapes, uh, in a row and then recycling them because you had a, uh, a week of, of redundancy or a week of data left over. But if you remember the days of, you know, a fault tolerance plan was measured in raid, uh, redundant array of inexpensive disks um, and RAID 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, et cetera. I had a company, Nameless. I don't even think they exist anymore. They had been mirroring their netware volumes and backing up with tape. Now, what I didn't know is that the mirror had fallen out of sync. So the mirror was broken. And just like in superstition, that's seven years of bad luck if you break <laughs> break your your disc mirroring. But also the tapes weren't actually accurate either. They weren't functioning properly. So when I broke the mirror or separated the mirrored drives, six months of work gone, gone in that type of uh, environment. You have anything now? I obviously I don't expect you to. To say that you, you know, caused like I did uh, the issue, but anything you walked into, Luck, on yeah. That? Luckily, luckily, as an admin, it was actually things like backup that decided to, that I decided I need to get out of the admin business. Right? <laughs> I'll be honest; like I was dealing with tapes and cycling and through. I decided I had to get out of this business. I wanted to get more on the, the building and the architecture side. But yeah, it was definitely tapes. You know, one. One fun one that I do remember, you know, this is this is a a, a VDI related story. Like I said, I had one customer that you know they were they were going through and and uh, trying to save space on storage and VMs, and they were worrying about how much they were spending on virtualization and things like that. And I kind of related to it earlier. And they assigned um, external contractors to come into the environment to go clean up stuff. And during their cleanup. Uh, rather than having a procedure to say, okay, you, you snapshot the VM or you export the VM, you make sure it's backed up and recoverable, um, they just started saying, well, we haven't seen anybody log into this machine for three months and deleted the SQL database that had all of the databases that are necessary for VDI to function. Um, I remember getting the phone call from the customer <laughs> And uh, if that customer's listening, uh, he, they'll probably remember the story. But in that conversation, I, I, it was pretty. It was an easy conversation. Did you back it up? Nope. Did you have any recovery methodology? Nope. SOL, man, you are going to be rebuilding that environment from scratch. Now, yeah. the one thing that we did have, we actually had good documentation. And that documentation had been created and updated about a month or two previously. So that was something we helped that customer to develop mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of maintain. So they were able to at least manually recover all of the things that they needed to do. Yeah. But like in terms of an outage, that was a, a good two days where they were done and out for the count for a significant size environment, probably about three to 5,000 users of VDI yeah. uh, that were just down and out. 
And that's well, interesting. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, in a lot of these, a lot of mindsets are, you know, of course it's critical to back up the the data, the user data and whatever the employees happen to be, you know, doing on their daily basis, the documents, quote unquote, or the database files themselves. Um, and even the database uh, applications or the mission critical applications, you get the idea. But I'll, I've actually heard from people that, oh, you know, it's just the virtual desktops. And so what if I lose my, my, you know, VDI? Um, it's, it's just the virtual desktop. What, what's the big deal? And I'm always like, okay, go up to a nurse or a practitioner and tell them their virtual desktops are down and out and they'll be, yeah. they'll be down and out for two days. That it's, it's a big deal because that's your access point. That's how you get into those mission exactly. critical apps. I usually sit down with customers and talk about, you know, you probably have some sort of tiering methodology for, for databases or systems, right? DR. So tier one data uh, applications would be the critical applications or mission critical apps. And then I start going, okay, well, that's great for tier zero. What's required to make that application usable by your users? That should be tier zero, right? So your tier one apps rely on tier zero to function. That would be simple things like Active Directory, file services, the database services that are underlying for that application. And more often than not, some sort of VDI solution that front ends that application, right? So I end up usually trying to identify where is your VDI deployment in your tiering? And they're like, oh, it's tier four. It's, yeah, we'll get to it when we get a chance. They're like, that's the only way you get to any of these tier one or tier two applications. It's got to be tier zero. Right. And in fact, actually, we've been having conversations with customers around, you know, when even if Citrix and VDI should not be your primary um, uh, solution for some of these applications, when you're in a DR mode, it might be, yeah. right? You might be you might be in a scenario where like let's get a good example like ransomwares where your endpoints are all um, you know compromised. Now you need to tell everybody you know don't use your corporate laptop. Go find another device to go use and access the environment. Here's a VDI desktop to gain access to those components. So now suddenly they start elevating uh, VDI into a higher level or higher tier of that conversation because of that reason. Yeah, it's it's almost like if you walk up to somebody and say, hey. Um, you know, where's your car keys? Well, I don't know. They're around somewhere. I didn't really, you know, maybe they're in my coat pocket or something like that. Well, okay. Try to start your car <laughs> without your car keys. You know, they're, yeah. they're pretty critical. So often overlooked, often uh, under uh, valued, but you got to replace that, especially today. You can't hotwire a car like we used to. You got to, <laughs> I mean, these key fobs are very complicated. Um, Wait, you, you've hotwired cars, Sean? I well, let's just say I, <laughs> back in I'm, your youth. <laughs> yeah, I'm no stranger to uh, to jumping with a screwdriver <laughs> <laughs> across the solenoid um, because you lost your keys. That's why. That's the uh, yeah, why. yeah, exactly. We'll say that. Um, have you ever dealt with? And this is uh, you know the very uh, timeline event for me, uh, and I know this goes back many years, but. Um, uh, post 9-11, I remember talking to people and, uh, you know, I was, I was into the app virtualization space in those days. And it was the, the magnitude of the, well, we had, you know, redundant data centers in our facilities, but we then started realizing that having those redundant data centers in our same building was not a a great approach uh for obvious reasons now but even back yeah. then we didn't necessarily consider it um and two things on that obviously you know the building uh being the disaster itself but then also um you know a hurricane moved through one of my customers and back in those days the data center was in the basement that's where yeah. we belonged and that's where they put us <laughs> so the data center being in the basement, a hurricane comes through, floods out everything, floods out the basement. 
And now we had redundant servers, but they were sitting on the floor right next to the production server. <laughs> so we walk into the data center and everything's bobbing around like apples in a barrel. And that was our disaster recovery. But um, it, so Pete, my point is people are still doing that, though. And they've branched out to remote office or colo locations as that redundancy. And I want to get your your take on that because to me, you know, maintaining a separate facility in all of the duplicate twin data center that we would need to maintain up and running in the uh, event of a disaster and the work behind that. I mean, is that, am I crazy in thinking that's just not the way to go or what's your take? Yeah, it's. It's interesting. I've, I've had some conversations with different organizations, different types, different verticals, where there's reasons for it, right? Um, we're, we're working with one hospital from a regional pers- their regional hospital, and um, just the way they're physically situated within, the, within their city locale, there's one major internet pipe for them to get to the rest of the internet. So mm-hmm. they're like, hey, if that gets severed, we don't have anything, right? So they, when they start thinking of cloud and cloud services, they're like, we're down if someone severs that. So yeah. they've decided, yes, while it is more costly to have a colo and a second pair of everything and try to replicate everything, um, they've gone down that path. I've seen some scenarios too, Sean, where customers have tried to do things like move, buy new gear, take the old gear that's in production, ship that over to DR, and that's their DR gear. Right, And then you start running into scenarios of like, oh, well, we can't run the same capacity. We, um, you know, things and feature sets are not available. Like, okay, to be supported, we have to upgrade. Oh, well, those boxes can't be upgraded. Those are end of life now. And so to your point, it's definitely a very costly conversation. And, you're, and we try to simplify it for our customers and say, look, if you're, if you're going to go with a colo, let's try to figure out what we can do to simplify. Don't have these silos of systems start building out you know, more uh, intelligent ways of doing things so that you can move machines across back and forth. Maybe maybe your DR site also becomes your test dev environment, right? right. Leverage, leverage that gear that would have been sitting there unused, roughly speaking, 99.9% of the time and use it for your test dev environment. That way you're kind of keeping things up to date and working. But even then that's becoming more and more difficult, you know, depending on how customers are doing the, those components. And by the way, yes, I have seen, a, I saw one customer, by the way, that had a DR data, their production data center get flooded when the, in a legal bathroom was built above the story above them <laughs> and flooded and flooded their data center below them. And they were like, well, how did we not get notified? All of their alerting servers happened to be in the top of the racks and were the first thing to get shorted out. Oh, no. So, so they were like, okay, lesson learned, move alerting servers to the middle, right? <laughs> Don't leave them up top because they can get hit by the top. Don't leave them on the bottom because they can get flooded. Put them somewhere in the middle so that hopefully you got a good chance of surviving and telling you that you got an outage. Oh, is that trickle-down economics or is that raining yeah, on their I don't, I, It was funny. At one point, everyone was like, get in the room and start shutting things down. And then someone's like, that's an illegal bathroom upstairs. And I was like, wait, which pipe broke? <laughs> oh, that pipe. Yeah. I'm not going in that data center. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, but that brings us to, um, I mean, the, the explosion availability of cloud, I have to think, and I have been uh, talking about this a lot with people that changes the ball game. Uh, and instead of having that colo remote office duplicate, you know, data center, that's a what if, or, you know, just in case, uh, model with all that expense and management. And then the, the people that are required to maintain and keep them in sync and up to date, how's, how's the cloud changing that? How is Azure and AWS changing, changing that approach? For my DR perspective, exactly. The, the big, the first step is just consumption, right? Being able to consume it, pay for it while you're using it, and then shutting it down and not paying for it. That's definitely been very beneficial. I think also what I described earlier when I said, you know, the cloud providers don't think of DR and BC. They have regions, they have zones. They've already thought about all those things, and they have best practices to tell you, like, all right, within 
within a region, we have these zones. As long as you kind of move some stuff around in here, you're kind of be redundant in that architecture. And then they provide ways to replicate the data across zones. So now you can even have another environment just in case something goes wrong. So mm -hmm. we're definitely seeing an, uh, an increase in cloud-based DR conversations for that consumption reason yeah. and for that kind of native uh, redundancy in a lot of the architectures that is already the underlying foundation, right? You don't have to worry about power and generators. Like that was another thing we all used to have to worry about, right? Okay, great. The data center is working. How long can it run without power? And what's the generator look like? And then when? how quickly can they get gas if that generator starts running out of gas? That, right. That's not even your problem anymore. That's somebody else's problem. Yeah, because everything is now maintained and managed by, well, let's face it, Microsoft and Amazon aren't too shabby uh, as far as their redundancy and, and SLAs for, I'm going to assume it's 99.999% availability. Yeah. Um, and then, but also Nutanix Cloud Clusters plays a role into that because if I'm not mistaken, you can maintain in your cloud vendor, AWS and Azure, um, an environment. And I, I, you know, would like to call it a pilot light environment. So you've got your subscription running in the cloud and you're keeping it on the warming plate. Uh, and keeping those images in sync so that in the, but you're not fully utilizing, you haven't burst into the cloud yet because obviously your, your primary data center on prem is still functioning. But in the event of that disaster, it lights up that pilot light, expands to the cloud and duplicate or, you know, stands up all those images, 2000 in like a two hours or something. Um, and then all your employees are switching back over to that. But what I love about the idea is hopefully disasters don't last forever. Unlike my disaster of a haircut don't last forever. And when it's over, you spin it. Is this right? You spin it down and go back to your on-prem primary data. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the idea of the hybrid architecture, right? So burst DR when you need it, bring it back when you don't. So you kind of hit on two things. One is, is the burst ability, but two, I think you nailed it earlier, which you said, talked about the complexity that most colo type architectures have, where Nutanix, uh, you know, NC2 has their capabilities is around simplifying that, right? So now instead of having to figure out how to convert your on-prem VM into AWS's architecture into EC2 or how to convert it into Azure, there is no conversion. It's basically the same interface. Yeah. So now, now what ends up happening is the NC2 cluster that exists over in Azure and AWS is just an extension of your Nutanix Prism concept, right? And cluster concept. So now you can go into Prism, you know, select which repositories you want to replicate, the frequency, set up your RTOs and RPOs, and be able to replicate that over. And to your point, simple, easy to do set up your recovery points. Now you have an outage for your on-prem, cool. Maybe it's an internet connection problem. Cool, let's fail everybody over, burst them up while we need to, and then bring them back. And then let's say it's a complete disaster, right? You lose your entire production data center, just catches fire or gets flooded. All right, it's gonna require you to get some new gear. You're gonna have to wait for your data center to get up. That means you're gonna need to be running for a while. You need that scalability and that power mm -hmm. uh, of the cloud and continuing to burst. And maybe people need more capacity. Maybe people need less capacity. Whatever it is, that flexibility is very important during that DR scenario. And then bringing it back. Once you bring that infrastructure back, you want to have that optimized cost because while, while the cloud is good, it is expensive. It's someone else's data center. They're charging you for it, right? right? And so there's an uplift to run those machines. So if you're going to be bursting, you want to know you're bursting for the right reasons, not just because you're just going to leave it there forever. Yeah. And I think that's a very uh, easily overlooked point is that it, as you're using, because a lot of people I found, especially early on in cloud adoption, they would stand it up, tee it up in the cloud, leave it running in the cloud and forget that the meter is running for that consumption. If you've got until those accounting, Azure... Until accounting came and said, hey, what's this extra zero doing at the end of your budget? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And if you've got those Azure credits, okay, well, you had to use it anyways, but nah, it, it exceeds that. Um, so I love that that uh, notion that you bring up of being able to 
first on demand, but more as important being able to shrink it or, or tailor it down. That's why I love to call it. It's the, it's this cloud approach. This hybrid cloud approach to BCDR is like the elastic waist pants at Thanksgiving, you know, yeah. as I need, it's going to expand and grow. But hopefully after Thanksgiving, it's going to be able to shrink back down to what uh, I, I got. I got to work on that part myself. Yeah, that's yeah. never happened. I don't know who I'm, who I'm trying to kid. But. Then Christmas kicks in and uh, holidays and there's cookies. Yeah. Anyway, and maybe life, January. Just life itself. So, Al, this has been amazing. A great conversation. I love talking BCDR. Uh, again, for uh, our listeners out there, they've fallen in love with the Al Solarzano. Where are they going? Where are they going to get more Al? Yeah, more. Well, more, more me. You can definitely check me out on, on Twitter and LinkedIn. And, and uh, I'm at the Al Solarzano, as you mentioned. Uh, LinkedIn, you can definitely look me up there. Uh, but e360.com is our, is our company's website. Uh, I've actually been here for uh, coming up on 18 years, which is kind of crazy, right? When you start thinking of consulting and IT jobs and things like that, like I found a home, Sean. Yeah. I found a home and love working here. love working with the people I do. And uh, it's a great organization. You know, we deal with all these things that we're talking about today. But, uh, you know, we're also doing a lot with, with like next gen, you know, IT modernization conversations for redeveloping replatforming applications, security architectures and things like that. So it's not just uh, it's not just the old end user computing concepts. Right. It's getting into <laughs> the digital workplace. It's getting into modern infrastructure and cybersecurity and DevOps and automation. So it's a lot different than it uh, used to be. So. Right. But, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Always awesome. love talking to you, Sean. Well, hopefully we'll convince you to come back on uh, again real soon uh, and talk all all things Nutanix, all things uh, NC2, and then even our, our public cloud uh, partners, Azure, AWS, and some of our VDI partners, Citrix and, uh, and VMware and whatnot. So, Al, thank you again. And everybody out in the Ethernet, make sure you tune in and check out because we're going to keep the stories from the EUC road going. All right, everybody. We'll catch you next time. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Nutanix Community Podcast. Be sure to visit next.nutanix.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our bonus content. So with that, from your friends here at Nutanix, have a wonderful Christmas holiday.